The internet cipher started um, really just some months ago as a response to hold space virtually for our community and to support our artists uh, during the transition of sheltering at home. And we wanted to intentionally do this inter internet cipher today, our last one of the year. And we wanted to use the Zoom platform despite the challenges that it brings because of the gallery mode aspect. We wanted to see everyone. And again, this is a virtual community space that we're holding. So we encourage y'all to have your videos on so we can see your faces and your reactions. We encourage you to use the reactions um, feature of Zoom and to use the chat as well. You can share your thoughts, um, you know, because as we all know, artists give so much of themselves to us through their art and this conversation will also be a very generous, they'll be generously giving so much to us through this conversation. So we wanna give back and we can do that through the ASL um, applause or snaps. We can type in the chat reactions, definitely questions. If you have questions, please share them in the chat. I'll be filtering through those um, and use the reactions as well. And um, also if you wanna share on social media in live time or afterwards, we encourage you to, to at Iman Central, at this love thing, um, and also to use the hashtags this love thing and Iman Arts. That's another way if you don't get your question out today, if you engage the artists on, on social media, I'm sure they'd love to respond back there as well. So we'll drop the socials in the chat and then I wanna encourage y'all to use that as well. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce our, um, our host of the conversation, um, Dr. Crystal Chanel Truscott. If you don't know her, definitely want to know her, look her up and her work. She is our former senior arts advisor um, for the arts and culture work at Iman. And she's also a professor of, associate professor of performance studies at Northwestern University in Chicago, a playwright, theater artist. She founded a phenomenal uh, theater company called Progress Theater. We'll also drop that link in the chat. I want y'all to check that out. We're so honored to have you, um, Dr. Crystal, and I'm going to turn it over to you to facilitate this conversation. Thank you, Sadia, and welcome everybody. Peace and blessings. It's nice to see all these uh, squares on my screen and familiar faces and new faces. I'm really excited to um, guide us through this conversation and inviting um, Rami Nashashibi, Andrea Denor to share and invite us into their process of making this album. So I won't give too much of a lead up. I want us to dive in because we've got so much to cover. Um, there's so many things that I love talking about and thinking about and thinking through with this, with this piece of work. So to start, I will say that this love thing to me seems like one of the biggest and most generous invitations in terms of the title for an album because everyone has an entry point to love, to understanding love, to feeling it, to engaging it, to wanting it, to missing it, all of these things. And I just find that the album for me is such a wide ranging uh, journey um, and spectrum and exploration on, on love and its ebbs and its flows and expressions and manifestations. I started to make a list um, at some point when I was listening, I don't know, I can't, even, I can't count how many times I listened to the album now, but I made a list and I was like, wow, there's divine love, sacred love, broken love, communal love, um, love for justice, love for someone, love for a place, love for a memory, love and pain, love and redemption, love and loyalty, love for the ancestors, love for our descendants and the people who will be on this planet when we're long gone. So, and that's just like the start of my list. So I'm gonna use that <laughs> as, a, as a catalyst to get us started in this conversation with um, a clip from the song Jerusalem, which is the first track on the album. Um, and really the beginning of this invitation on love. Love the broken man, where's my broken man? Who hit the floor and rolled again? Who told the devil and his friends? I got your dinner roll and the kids. They held captive. I 
As um, Sadia mentioned in my intro, I'm a theater artist, so I'm a person that definitely favors live and being um, present live. I just want to invite you all who haven't listened to the album yet to go back and listen to these songs that we'll be sampling today. I mean, listen to the whole thing, but <laughs> certainly the ones that we'll be able to do a deep dive in. Um, so that was a clip from Jerusalem. And um, the first word sung on the album um, in this song is love or it's love in the past tense. So the lyrics for anyone who might have missed it or loved a broken man raised by broken men who hit the floor and rose again. So for me, that's like, I don't know, three love stories in one with just that opening line. So I want, my first question is to, is to Rami, just as the writer of the songs on the album, um, and, but in particularly just giving us a deep dive into Jerusalem and this, this first line that starts the journey. What is the love story that starts Jerusalem and this whole album? Um, so peace and blessings, everyone. Salaamu Alaikum. Thank you, Dr. Truscott, for, for, for being here um, and for everyone for joining. I think um, there are so many multiple love stories, I think, as you pointed out in your introduction. But I think, um, I think it's fair to say that the opening is a love story of brokenness. And um, and I think brokenness in all its pain and oppressiveness sometimes, but also on one side of the spectrum and on in all its glory on the other side of the spectrum. One of the interesting words used in the, the Muslim tradition and in Arabic for love is hub. Uh, and that word also is a reference to a seed. And uh, it is actually literally a seed. The heb is a seed. And the idea that a seed has to break open, that, there, that there's something that comes out of brokenness that is life-giving, that is beautiful, that is nurturing, I think is part of one, one of the many themes, I think, that I think permeate um, a lot of the songs. And the fact that it's embedded in this ultimate uh, and very personal, but I think also universal metaphor for brokenness. Jerusalem uh, for, for millennia has been a site where broken human beings have uh, dreamed of coming to in the prayer and the hope uh, for some type of spiritual mystical redemption to that brokenness. And um, it just felt like the right way to open up the album. Thank you for that. Already um, so many, so many layers just in terms of how love moves across generations and spaces and time and gets passed down um, and, and the ways that we inherit, you know, those, those stories and that experience. Um, Sister Drea, I want to come to you um, also reflecting on Jerusalem as the first song because I often, I, I believe that to non-artists and even to artists that collaboration and the magic of it can feel like a mystery, um, right? So that it's, it's technical, but then it's not technical. Like there's a fluid and embodied process for collaboration for many, many artists. And um, you are, and your voice is the way that we as listeners experience this, this album. Your voice is the invitation into all of these emotional spaces and spiritual spaces um, through your in interpretation of these songs that Rami wrote and you do it so beautifully um, and with such care. I can't even imagine another artist um, doing you know, these songs and I feel like it's such Thank you. Thank a you. credit to you and a sign of, 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 of um, the depth in which you engage the practice and the process of collaboration. So I would just love for you to share with us a bit about the process of being an artist who is a collaborator and a receiver that merges someone else's words with your distinctive creative expression. I have heard and I love to hear you talk about yourself being a vessel in this process of wrapping yourself in a song um, and, and, and listening for what's there, for what needs to be there. So just reflecting on Jerusalem, can you share some of what you experienced receiving and then working on the song as a collaborator and as a vessel? 
Mm-hmm. Wow. Thank you for um, noting everything that you said. Yeah, the collaboration process is really uh, a very, very spiritual process for me. It's um, very much a part of my spiritual practice to um, listen. And throughout this process, you know, Rami would send me a song um, and he would, uh, it was his vocals and his uh, lyrics, and he would be playing the melody on the guitar. And so this is the first time I've, I've really worked in this capacity. And so I did, I wasn't afraid of the process. Um, just when I'm doing music, I either feel it or I don't. So I don't, I don't, I don't like to have to search for um, a way to connect. It, it either instantly happens or it's just not going to happen at all. And so with this song, Jerusalem, um, when Rami sang it to me and, and I read the lyrics, I was like, wow. So for me, it was important to, to hum and to um, really just connect with the sound that I'm, that I was raised on, which is like in the, in the black church, I was raised by my black grandmother. And every single morning when I was a child, my grandmother would be on her knees. She has this little orange chair in the front room. And she would, I could, I would wake up and see my grandmother on her knees, her face in the Bible. And sometimes she's just moaning and humming and, and having this conversation with her God without words that I understood. But those hums really, um, it didn't feel like, I, I didn't feel like I was intruding by hearing the hums. The, her moans and her groans really sounded like she was talking to God on my behalf too. And in a way she was uh, inviting me into the conversation. So to start the album like that and to start that song like that with those hums, you know, it really, it really was um, it's very much a, a part of my spiritual practice. It's a spark. It's, it's it's how I connect to God. It's how I um, hear from God. It's it's how I create a setting and create a space to to cultivate something that I think could blossom into something really beautiful that people can actually indulge in. Okay. That was so beautiful um, and so many things, <laughs> so many things, but what, I mean, that you gave us the sacred reminder of like the craft of listening and the craft of deep listening, you know, that as the first step to collaboration, like that there, there wasn't another step to take without that, right, without listening first, but then also I just really love that the first word that we hear um, on the song is love or loved, but the first sound that we hear are these moans and these hums that you're talking about. So for me, that blend of, of the way that the collaboration cemented itself to start this beginning invitation was really, really just beautiful. And you laid it out so well. Um, and really it's such a great lead up to my next question. Um, one of my favorite things to talk about is um, ancestral practice, right? And um, how ancestral practice and layering lives in the lives of our artists um, and really in us, in us all. But I want to cite specifically a moment in Mama Please that um, is one of my favorite moments, um, which is, and we'll play, we'll play a bit of it, but I want to give a preface just for people who are listening for the first time. And if you, you, you can't hear it like you want to on this Zoom, and trust me, you won't, you'll want to turn it up and hear it somewhere else in a private moment, just to remind you to reflect on, on, on this section. So where there is what I call the Mama Please call to prayers, or many calls to many prayers, like in this, this one moment that really captures um, uh, ancestral practice that is cultural, um, that is spiritual, um, uh, and that is sacred, right? So our spiritual ancestors and our cultural ancestors, it all at once to me, and you're really, you're, you're calling a praying the word mama, right? Mama and please. And for me, when I hear that song, that moment in the song, I automatically am reminded of the field songs and Negro spirituals of our enslaved ancestors here 
in the United States. I'm also reminded of the call uh, to prayer, the Adhan in Muslim tradition and what it means to call the voice and call the community, right? Mm -hmm. uh, to remember God. And then also, as you mentioned, Dre, like this sacred practice um, in black church tradition and in gospel music of what it means to really use the voice as a tool for freedom, right? And aspiration. And then of course that, you know, it was, George Floyd's last word and his last call and his last prayer, right? Um, his, what we heard in him in his transition, right? From, from this life, his last prayer. So I just want us to listen to this clip of this moment and mama please, and then I'll ask you all to speak about it a bit more. <laughs> So, you know, Drea, I've heard you talk about Mama Please as a song that you wrestled with um, and one that it never felt done until you recorded that moment in between the chorus and when um, Ja'Cory Arthur's verse starts. Um, so especially for me, having witnessed you perform, you as an artist perform live, I experienced so much embodied and intuitive um, ancestral practice and sacred trust in, in the work and in the way that you perform. Did you and do you see ancestral practice as a part of your work as a vessel in this piece in particular? And what was the process like of reaching for that moment, right? Like, did you plan it? Could you have planned it? What made you know that the moment was right or done as you were wrestling with that song? Absolutely, 100%. It's, it's a, and that moment was, was an ancestral practice. That moment, um, I, we had finished the song, you know, maybe, I can't remember, end of June, July. And then we started working on the music video and having, um, you know, sent it to Chikori and got the choir on there. So every time, so we had several versions that was mixed to allow other people to make their contribution. And every time I, I heard it, I, I was like, yeah, well, I just got to do my part over because I'm like, I'm, I know I laid down a, a good foundation for other people to to come and make their contribution. But I knew that I wasn't um, I hadn't offered in the in the way that that felt like uh, true to that moment. Uh I hadn't, I hadn't made an offering that felt like I was being obedient to what my spirit was leading me to do. So um, we, we were recording in a, in a different space other than the studio. And it was, it was a good setting. Um, we were out kind of surrounded by nature and it was very late and it was kind of like, okay, so what part did you want to do, Drea? Like Elijah's like, cause I'm, I'm about to, you know, do the final mix of the song. So like, come on. And it was, a, it was not something I was able to verbalize. I can't explain, like, I need to sing like this for this amount of time. And in this way, I just needed the space to be able to listen better. So, um, so in order to do that, for me to even hear what was in that section, I had to pull the drums out. I mean, the section wasn't there at all. So, but even like before, um, even before the uh, Jacory comes in, that little, I had to create a space before that. So we took out the drums, took out the bass, took out the piano. I had to strip everything down and really just listen to 
to what was in that space. And what I heard was not only George singing Mama, but I heard almost like all these other ancestors singing Mama too. And they were, it was like, it, the ancestors created a, a chorus and they created a large chorus and they were singing with George when he said mama. So that's what I heard. And it was like, his cry wasn't, wasn't a lone cry. You know, it wasn't just, it wasn't merely a, a, a lament. I, what was, that's what I was feeling in that moment. It wasn't merely a lamenting. It was actually, um, he was joining an invitation to join in with the ancestors. And I'm studying um, death right now and black death and reimagining black death. And so as we, like the closer we get to that transition point, then I, I do believe, and it's been written in many texts that ancestors do come for us to usher us into the next realm to the ancestral realm to what I call home you know and I'd like to offer that perhaps he actually saw his mother and maybe he was actually like oh my god like mom like yeah please take me with you like take me with you and I think that that was what was happening all I was hearing all of that so I had to even create a song on the keyboard that mimic if you listen uh there's no oohs and ahs in the background it's it's actually a sound I'm playing on the keyboard that sounds like a chorus to me. So it was important to me to frame that moment as, and then I was thinking about the transition from the spirit leaving the body, going to the ancestral plane and imagining what does that sound like? What does that journey sound like? And I was, I, I really was trying to position myself to, to really hear what that sound was. And that was uh, my intention for framing that section in that way. So many powerful things in what you just said, but one of my biggest takeaways from what you just shared, Drea, was not thinking about lament, but really, or only lament, but also ascent, right? That this was um, this call and <laughs> journey and this transition that had um, more power in it, right? Um, mm -hmm. Just lament. And, and I feel like it's so beautifully captured in the way that that moment crescendos to um, Jacori's verse. So thank you so much for sharing sharing that beautiful, beautiful insight. Um, Brother Rami, I want to come back to you and ask. Um, so I said earlier, you know, before we listened to the clip of Mama Please that I experienced the layering of so many sacred traditions in this song and, and in, in the whole album, but I'm thinking musically, thematically, culturally, um, and for me, knowing you, it makes sense um, that your writing has all these layers and intersections of, of various um, sacred traditions, practices, and ancestral practices. So I'm just wondering if you intended or did you dream that the, the album would manifest, or this song in particular would manifest in these layers of cultures and traditions and ancestries? Um, how does ancestral practice for you in, in, in whatever way it manifests? So I'm not just talking about like our genetic ancestors, right? But our spiritual ancestors, our community ancestors, et cetera. How does ancestral practice and remembrance live in the album for you? Would you say that ancestral love is one of the layers of the love stories um, as you know, love for communities? I'm just would love to hear you riff a bit on the, the layers of expressions of love that you were working on with this piece. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just, I think there, there's two layers maybe I want to speak to. Um, one, one, the very personal, again, going back to Jerusalem as this ultimate metaphor. Um, for me, you know, I, I come from a family on my father's side that goes back literally over 700 years in Jerusalem, a very, very deeply Jerusalem rooted family. And you know, at one point, Dre and I were staying at uh, in in the heart of a Hasidic community in Brooklyn, uh, about to record this, and I, it was something so beautifully familiar for me in that hotel. It was run by these Orthodox rabbis, and in that morning, I got up and I was having tea, and there was an Orthodox rabbi reading the text and. He looked over at me, thought I was Jewish. And we, I said, well, I said, I'm from Jerusalem. He said, I, you know, we, we had this conversation before Drea was coming down. 
and we stumbled on our love, the, our kind of mutual love for Jerusalem and, and this kind of from a very mystical way. And just, I think the idea that there's this ancestral connection of multiple traditions with Jerusalem, this kind of, um, you know, obviously it's been the source of a lot of pain, that same love, but it's also been, you know, there, there are moments where we just talked about this very famous line in this movie, A Kingdom of Heaven, that some of you may have seen, where Salah Adin Saladin at the end uh, is having this conversation with Bailey in the Christian night as he surrenders Jerusalem. And he says this one famous line, what does Jerusalem mean to you? And at one point he says, Salah Adin says everything. And then he walks a couple feet and he turns back and he says nothing. And so this idea that Jerusalem both is this ancestral symbol of, again, a spiritual lineage and connection uh, to a both very terrestrial space, but also the ability to uh, also recognize that there's something celestial about its connection, its aspiration. I think um, that, that ancestral connection to spiritual tradition uh, is something that I think is very deep. But also, you know, you uh, as you hear Drea speak, and you talked about Drea being a vessel and how she collaborates. But I think the other thing I would talk about Drea for me in this entire journey has been guide. She was a guide for me. She wasn't just a vessel. And and I mean that in so many ways. I mean, part of it was, uh, of course, I already have been unapologetically very very shaped by Black American spiritual traditions, uh, especially the encounter with Islam and all of the multiple ways in which that is manifested. And the fact that it opens up with a prayer, and I think she's on by Layla Muhammad, who utters the Bismillah in the name of the divine, most gracious, most merciful. This is the daughter of Imam Murthy Muhammad, the granddaughter of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Uh, and, uh, you know, who has her own ancestral connection to the traditions. Um, for me, the fact that we open with that, uh, the fact that so much of this journey has been what, what you just heard Drea mentioning. I haven't heard Drea articulate that, you know, the, the kind of the hums and, and, but it just all always felt right that she opened up that way. The fact that uh, Rani Ma'ali, who I think is on this Zoom, the, the extraordinary, just amazing multi-instrumentalist, the fact that he opens up with, I knew we heard Oud, and, the, and, and Rani could talk about the ancestral, you know, origins, the, the fact that the Oud is the genealogical origins of the modern day guitar, uh, for me is also something, to have that instrument with the very sacred sound and this lineage uh, combined with the kind of that Black church tradition that Drea brings into the, the humming and the pain, the kind of the, the, the almost a hurt that you hear in the very beginning uh, of this album, uh, both in its, again, both in its beauty and its pain, I think was important and speaks to ancestral trauma as well as ancestral kind of, you know, resilience, um, which again is something we both, I think, lean into, shape by and draw from. And the fact that it opens again with all of that was, was nothing we really intentionally scripted uh, as, a, you know, that wasn't, but it all, I think we always kind of just felt it and, and it and it came about that way in ways that felt right. Um, um, and as each layer was kind of brought in, um, I think we all knew uh, when it, you know, it was converging in a way that all uh, seemed to reinforce that larger theme. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. I mean, thank you just for reminding us of how powerful ancient spaces are. You know, um, and really, I mean, I think that we can kind of take for granted when we hear Jerusalem, but to hear you talk about 700 years, you know, um, and really being able to, to make that connection and to how, um, you know, just kind of um, the power and the inheritance of that. But also the thing that I heard and what you said, or one of the things that I will take away from that is just how ancestral practice recognizes ancestral practice so that we can have you, Andrea and Ronnie 
in a space, each bringing, right, your own relationship to ancestral knowledge and ancestral practice, and that it works. Um, you know, that, that those traditions can be in call and response with each other to create um, a really wide invitation to people who are listening and experiencing. So thank you. Um, The last song that I want us to touch on a little bit um, is, is Better When, which is the song that uh, that closes closes the album. And for me, I would say that it, it in addition to Mama Please, or maybe, sec maybe second to Mama Please, that it um, reinforces this idea of social justice as intimately tied to the sacred, right? And I mean sacred, like not exclusively religious, Right, um, but spiritual in the sense are like in the Muslim tradition, we say that we can serve God by serving humanity, right? Um, but I'm also thinking about those things that we hold sacred like life and love and freedom and, and access and opportunity. I'm thinking about MLK's um, beloved community concepts and just that social, social justice and freedom seeking are intimately tied right, um, to love and to the sacred. So I wanna play this clip from Better Win and then I'll come back and ask you all just to chat a bit about that. You sing with sages and I, and I paint the pages. So much better than, so much better when we mend in the minds and we bring back the shine. That good old boy behavior, never thought we would make it, even when put blood on the wager, heaven is a mile away, but a little too far to save it, they said, prayed on a downfall, even when they got the devil as a neighbor, a neighbor, as a neighbor, but maybe it was just a ghost, or maybe it was just a group of folks transforming people into ghosts, history, hey, can a dream with a hole in it float, how much better would we really be if they never invented boats? Would we kill like we kill if they never showed us the ropes? And we're barking around the wrong tree. Saw them and saw the wrong me. But I got the faith of a mustard seed. And I must have seen that I must succeed. And I must believe that we can achieve. Cause we the people who could be the people that can see the people that can free the people. So, um, Rami, I've, I've heard you say that you all did not set out to make a social justice album which might surprise people who know you <laughs> in your work, right? That, that that wasn't the explicit intention. And yet here's this album that in its exploration of love um, really loves justice, right? Um, and it loves justice, it invites us to love justice. It loves community and invites us to love community. It loves people who came before us the ancestors and the people who will come after us and invites us to do the same. So there's all these invitations that are connected to, to love and justice. Um, for me, it makes sense to me that this album came to life in the way that it did just because of who you are and because of who Drea is and who you all are in your daily lives and with your families and with your communities that like this album um, on one level is, to me feels like an artistic manifestation of the way that you live your lives and the relationships that you all have nurtured and cultivated over the years. So I asked this question, um, you know, somewhat tongue in cheek, but also to really invite you all to talk about this, perhaps this concept of organic collaboration um, as relates to freedom seeking and justice seeking. So the question is how is a social justice album made without trying to make a social justice album. Um, and in doing that, I wanna invite you all to also just talk about um, some of the features and guests that you have on, on the album, like maybe to share a story with us of one of your favorite stories about how that collaboration came to be um, organically. Like what should people know when they are listening to a song like we just heard with Better When, um, and what, what should they know about that collaboration with Phenom, with Otis Moss, with the choir, with, you know, like how do all of these things come to life and how did the relationships that you all have and the work that you all do um, as artists, but also as members of community flow into organically and support this project? Did you want me to start? Was that, that's yeah. for both of us, okay. Yes, for both of you, but you can start, Ron. Okay, 
Um, well, I, I'll say this, you know, that I, I think one of the most, uh, you know, as some of you know the story, not only did we not set out to really create a social justice album, we really didn't even set out to create an album. I mean, this is, you know, this was uh, Drea taking, you know, a song that I wrote like over a year ago, uh, you know, last year when I wrote in that moment and inviting me into this artistic journey and space and willing to be my, to, to be a guide, a vessel. And then, and then it was just one song after the other until the materially merged into a full album um, with, with very common undergirding themes. I think it becomes a social articulations of love and social justice because part of one of the greatest uh, privileges I have and, and uh, and I think it was only underscored by being invited by Drea into Buffalo and into her world of Drea is that just everyone we're around, and I think this is part of what animates me so much in this work. You know, I, I think I have some people from old school, soci you know, I did sociology at University of Chicago and I did ethnography there. I just love telling, I love the stories of the people, the multifaceted stories, the complexity of the types of people that I've been privileged to be around. They're not just artists, they're social activist warriors, they're mothers, they're people who are, their lovers, they're connected to this work. And I think so often we just don't see that in, in you know, uh, publicly. We're only, especially people of color and people who come from struggle, we're often very, you know, unidimensional in one, you know, just fabric of a particular larger story. And so when you bring the people that we've brought together and we're, and we're in space, uh, the expressions of love and spirituality and social justice, they're all just interwoven into the larger collective. And so um, that's, I think, how the, the themes and the stories and the writing emerge pretty organically. Two stories that I'll say, and I think he was on here earlier, Jacory, I first met, he know his, his MC name was 1200, and now officially he is Councilman Jacory Arthur. You heard him on, on Mama Please. He is the youngest sitting councilman in Louisville's history. Um, I met him several years ago, and I just knew the moment I saw him on stage in this kind of uh, rich cultural context uh, that what he emanated on stage would be the type of person I know would be connected to us and our work. Um, I sent Jacory a very early, he started, Jacory became a part of our a roster and he was very much embedded in uh, the arts work that we were doing and um, and just became the type of person very connected to our work. We were connected to his activism and organizing. And while he's running for office, I, you know, I sent him this track and I, I, I didn't hear from Jacory for like a couple of weeks. I, I thought initially he just didn't really like it. He wasn't feeling it. And he said, I, I've been having it on repeat this entire time and 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 um and then when he dropped it he literally he we collaborated may a day or two before the elections in louisville and um you know lo and behold he went from just being an mc and this extraordinary human being an artist to now being this you know incoming councilman in louisville and i think that was something that kind of spoke to the political moment of the time in the midst of a pandemic here you have this this brother who's in the streets uh very connected to the to the movement of for justice for brianna taylor in louisville that had all of the eyes of the country on it and again none of that was planned none of that was like orchestrated beforehand it was just we knew jacory i knew jacory's voice needed to be on that track i knew if anyone could summon the spirit and soul of the transit, you know, that, that, that voice that was so resonant across the globe, George Floyd had become, and the words, I can't breathe and mama please were being written on, you know, walls across the world. And uh, I just see my, out of all artists, Ja'Cory was the one. And, you know, that's just one of so many of these collaborations really happened that way. They were organic. There are people who I've had this deep abiding love and respect for. And in the process of making it, uh, the, the work together, um, some really dynamic and very you know, uh, surprising things uh, happened. Um, and that was just one of them. 
Thank you. I mean, I'm, I'm so glad that you shared that story about Ja'Cory. I was thinking as you were sharing about how every artist, every artist's contribution um, elevates and expands a song. And that one of the ways that I feel like Ja'Cory's um, collaboration did is, is just in make what's the third line of his verse where Brianna's name is mentioned, right? So that it automatically opens up this idea of, of even, you know, gender specific violence and the, what stories are told and how they're told in connection to, you know, um, the relationship between George's mom to Brianna could have been a mom, you know, um, was really something that was heart, heart opening. Um, Drea, I would love for you to chime in on this question as well, just about organic collaboration and how community fits into it, you know, um, how, it, how it needs to, how it should and, um, yeah, just what, whatever feels right for you in terms of flowing on uh, on this question of, of how how is a social justice album made without intending to make it? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Rami, he, he so beautifully illustrated how um, organically the album just progressed. You know, it, it I think things progressed you know, like Rami went from writing one song and, and sending it to me and and sharing it with me and I and I responded to that and shared with him what I felt. Um, and then he was inspired to write another song and then he was inspired to write another song and then he was inspired to write another song. And then things were happening in the world while we were uh, having this exchange and this like dance, if you will, um, and so Rami is reflecting and internalizing and then I'm able to express in a way that was so necessary for me because the whole world shut down in the middle of us doing this project. And I'm an artist first. So you want me to like be in a house, be away from people and be away from community when my very essence, like the very fiber and fabric of, of who I am and and how I create and how I love and how I live my life is um, is threaded with community. Like community is, is the center of everything that I do. And so that was really interesting. So I needed, I desperately needed a way to, uh, to express what I was witnessing that was happening in the rest of the world and to be able to do it in a way that wasn't imprisoning I needed to be able to be free and I had never never did it like like this before you know normally I would see what's happening in the world and I'll write a song and I record it by myself just so I can get it out but because uh of what what I like to say these two pandemics that we're in um because of of these two pandemics then I feel like it was it was a direct threat on our breath and also a direct uh, threat and attack on community and how we connect with one another, how we commune with one another. And so the way this album uh, progressed and kind of like just developed its own wings was so beautiful because I think everybody involved shared that, 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 that feeling and that need for human in connection. And I think it shows up in Jerusalem. Like even in the beginning, we were talking about the, the moaning and groanings before. And I know I started, but Mamoni Yusuf, who is an incredible um, person, woman, mother, and artist, um, she's also on that song. Um, she's singing in the beginning and then she she performs like in a hip hop, uh, you know, offering. And in the beginning, you hear her coming in. Like when she heard the song, she felt like I, I need to I need to hum right there too, you know. And she's a black woman, but she's also um, a native. She's indigenous, and she knows who her tribe is. And she's she's she was raised in not only those ancestral uh, practices as like from an African you know position or seat, but she's also raised and um, you know her her mother is teaching her songs that the natives used to sing, you know what I mean? She's, her mother is literally like a healer, her grandmother and people in her family are medicine women. So she was raised on that. And so her hums and her oohs and her ahs, the way she chose to collaborate with me in that moment, 
she responded to an invitation and she it was like she was like I, I gotta say something right here so when she sent the track back we were just expecting a verse but we got way more than that and that was an example a beautiful example I wanted to highlight on on how how some of the collaborations on the album happened so organically because I think everything about how the album was is uh was created and framed was set up like a big invitation and that's how I imagine collaborations to be you know um there is the circle that exists and that we call community and so when you enter into the community um you need to be invited into the circle you know and so I think it was important to and I think it naturally happened um with Rami like Rami invited me into his circle by sending me the song. And then I responded to that. And then uh, we invited other people to come into that circle and, and create and emote and um, just just make their contributions, which I, which I think is so necessary for where we are in the world today. And then even in this discussion of like justice seeking and uh, freedom um, and liberation, which is like really important to me right now, I just think it's important to highlight that liberation requires community it requires community i mean you think of any any activist any any leader any any freedom fighter um you know you can even talk about harriet you know people often highlight harriet and she led all these people and she absolutely did that but she would not have been able to do that outside of a community of people uh, somebody was waiting for her in a car somebody else was making a phone call or sending a telegram to 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 somebody who was operating a boat and then there was somebody at a at a house at an unknown location that knew that somebody was going to be pulling up on a horse and there was going to be some people hiding in the back and you was going to have to hold them and feed them and keep them warm for a certain amount of time and then get them to their their destination and then when they got there they needed some some something to eat and some place to, to get cleaned and a uh, little something to put in their pocket so that they can live their lives as free people so she would not have been able to operate this underground railroad had there not been a community i think that's very important to highlight and so in the in this discussion of liberation today as it relates to this album which has is often you know uh, at the center of this conversation of like social justice, you know, we created a community. We created a community. We exist within community. And if we are to even imagine what it might look like to move forward, but then we must do that with community. So um, liberation requires community. And so this album required organic collaborations or we would not have been able to offer in the way that we did. You know, um, I think everybody from Phenom to Amir Suleiman to Memor Yusuf, uh, Kadir Latif, even my daughters on the album, um, Ronnie, everybody, I could go on and on, Jacory, I think they responded to an invitation. And when there's an invitation um, made from the center or from the circle, then you actually give people the opportunity to show up as they are and to make a contribution that is true and a contribution that is coming from a, a place of, of love and purity and they're able to offer it in a, in, the, in a very organic way. So I think organic cl collaborations are, are really, really important. And I think that um, even like uh, the, the work that we're doing, like, cause I, I have a, um, a food pantry here in Buffalo. You know, Rami um, is working with Iman. I'm also part of Iman on the artist roster. I think, you know, we're, we're always, we find ourselves doing this work in the community and this, this work needs to be supported, you know? And often the, the ones who are, are invited to support this work, um, they have experience in, in kind of setting up collaborations, you know? And these collaborations aren't always fostered upon like authentic relationships. So you find yourselves like finding, reaching out to people in the community who might have a similar goal or a similar mission, but you don't actually have a relationship with this person, but you kind of like work with them just long enough, you know, to, to get the support that you need. And hopefully you can continue to stay connected, but in many cases you, you don't remain connected. And so I think it's important to, when we talk about organic 
uh, connections and or again collaborations that they are rooted in a genuine um, connecting, genuine connections between other freedom seekers and other um, justice workers and just other humans in general. I think it's so important for us to continue to foster these organic collaborations where people can show up as our authentic selves and um, really just explore why we're here and help one another, like kind of hold each other's hand or at least bear witness to somebody else's journey um, to, of, of self-discovery and, and in terms of how they show up in these community circles. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. It's so good I had my mic on because <laughs> I was being your amen corner here, you know, um, and just like w would want to put like an asterisk next to community as a requirement for liberation, right? Um, on just a, a practice based level, and that you all, part of the methodology for working and for the way you live your lives, is already in. A, a steady practice of building community and connection and relationship, right? So it's not, as you described, oftentimes collaborations in the funding world means put these people together and see what happens. And collaborations in this type of work means what are the relationships that have been nurtured that can give the broadest invitation, include the broadest, you know, widest number of folks, and then allow what comes out of that right um that what comes out of that is the organic expression right and is a thing you know and so you you gave the secret sauce that's not an easy you know thing to um accomplish it's, it's easier said than done to this question of how do you create a social justice album without trying to is that there's no way to do that on um with a one-off with a with a, a blind date pairing right like that it has to be connected to relationship that there's longevity in it that it has to be connected to community and the work that Rami does with Iman and the work that you do with Feed Buffalo and all of the other things that you all do, right? Like just this, this practice that you all have of cultivating this, like that's what gives birth to these types of collaborations and the stories that you all have shared with us. So I just really love, love, love and, and appreciate you both for, um, for, for highlighting that. I, um, I want to, I'm going to transition us because we have um, a, a wonderful, wonderful person on the line um, to also share a, ref a reflection with us and are just so grateful um, to have Zeba Rahman, who I'm so pleased to introduce. Um, she has spent her career supporting and advocating for artists. I consider her to be a, a change maker in the field of, of doing that. She's curated festivals around the world and currently serves as the senior program officer of the Building Bridges program with the Doris Duke Foundation for Islamic Art. Welcome, Zeva. Thank you, Crystal, for such beautiful thoughts. Um, I'm really humbled and honored to be part of this gathering to be in community with all of you. Uh, thank you, Dre, thank you, Rami, for creating this heartfelt, really moving work. I just feel that uh, you have lifted up to us the value, the importance, the essential need to practice love. Love is life-giving. And I'm reminded of what Rumi says um, when he's written so much on love, but uh, one of my favorite quotes is that love calls everywhere and always. And he also says that love is the water of life. And the lover is the soul of fire. The universe turns differently when fire loves water. And the fire that we have is our social justice movement. And we are watering it with our love. And this then reminds me of what Martin Luther King has said, which is, that love is the only force 
transforming an enemy into a friend. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much for everything you do. Crystal, you're my sister in arms and in every way. Um, I, I'm just, thank you for guiding this conversation. So beautiful, so moved. Thank you, Zeba. Thank you, Zeba. What a beautiful reflection and just reminder of love as sacred, but also of love as action, right? Of something that we can do and that feeds and nurtures and grows. So just um, beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, I want to um, ask, ask another question um, to, to Rami and Andrea, just about on this idea of action and on this idea of organic collaboration and love and how it all mixes. And Rami, I'll start with you on this question. What are some of the things that you envision for what a, this love thing live event would look like, right? What would it take to capture the essence of all of the things that you have shared with us um, and talked about? And I mean that like in the dreamscape way, but I also mean it as like for people who would want to support the manifestation of that. Like, what does it mean to experience being in the presence of that actual community building and community making with the live event? Yeah, well, I, th I think, thank you so much for the question. And I think Drea said something, you know, both Drea and I also, you know, exist in the very real world of what it takes, the day-to-day -day struggle of forging community, forging space. I mean, it, it takes resources, it takes, extraordinary hours of collaboration. It takes people that believe in and invest in the larger vision. I think we were deliberate in inviting a lot of people on this Zoom who have been a very big part of that, whether it's, you know, all of Zeba's support through Doris Duke and many of folks here on MacArthur, the, the, the philanthropic community that is here, the, the those who believe in lifting up the story. I think our dreamscape is that as we forge into yet another unknown, unchartered year in front of us, we do, we are being bold enough to envision a multi-city tour and presentation of this love thing by the end of 2021 um, that would accompany, for instance, something like Iman's Community Cafe, plus a presentation of this love thing in maybe 10 urban cities across the, the, the country where we would spend more than just a day in presentation of the actual work along with the art, but would stay in, in workshops and in, in, in artistic community, forging that sense of community around the types of issues that we work on throughout the year, whether it's food justice, whether it's criminal justice reform, whether it's connecting art to creating and forging space and making connections, connecting disconnected communities, radically reimagining what is possible, um, and, and inspiring one another with, with what can come through those types of uh, connections. I think um, seeing that type of tour in the United States, eventually seeing that type of tour outside of the United States, quite frankly, in places in Europe and Africa and, and, and other parts of the world where we know that this, the themes of this love thing are resonant is kind of like, if you were to ask me the dreamscape with a phenomenal, you know, multi, uh, multimedia uh, presentation well, that would include, you know, live performance, dance, and multimedia stuff is, I think, the type of things we're beginning to not only dream about right now, but actually plan and talk to uh, supporters and underwriters for. And so some of you on this Zoom may be getting a very specific call from us as we have these conversations, because we'd like you to, to plan with us and to think about uh, what this looks like uh, next year. So thank you for that. Awesome. I just want to, to, to shout out our brother Omar Fendon who put in the chat, Jerusalem too, inshallah, you know. Um, um, and um, just uh, thank you for that, that reflection, um, Rami. I, I want to see, um, ask Jane, uh, excuse me, Drea to chime in on the dream or anything that you would add to the dream. And then I'll, I'll, I'll read some questions that we've gotten um, from folks on the call. You all have been so beautiful in the chat, I see so like the lovely shout outs to, you know, there's a lot of resonance around um, Zaber's reflection, like coming on the end of hearing Rami and Drea speak and, and just a lot of, of upliftment um, in the chat. So I wanna make sure to share some of the questions that have come in, but Drea, before we do that, can you share a little bit about what does the, what's the dream for a live version of this love thing? Yes, yeah, so, um... 
pretty much I, I I don't have much to add to what um Rami so beautifully illustrated. You know, I think being able to um present this music in the highest highest uh order if you will um the in the most beautiful way um with the the right instrumentation with um the right lighting with um the right sounds and to make sure that it's documented in a way that um everybody can feel like they're experiencing it when they watch it from wherever they may be. Um, I think that's really important. Um, I believe in evidence. I believe in documenting evidence. I think it's very important. I think that we need, to, it's important for us to, um, especially as people who have historically um, been erased and who have been victims of very intentional erasure, it's very important for us to not only lift our voices and to move our bodies and to make sounds that um, that speak to who we are as a people and also serve as praise to our Lord. But I think sound and movement is, is, is the way we show up as a people and uh, sound and movement is uh, how we leave evidence of our existence. And so it's important. Um, the, the the tour really is is not just about you know sharing the music and enjoying it and spreading it around to everybody else, but it's also about uh, creating and leaving evidence um, or seeds, if you will, in the ground that 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 will manifest at some point. And I think it's very important that when you're when you're in the practice of of evidence, that it is presented in in the in the best way in the most excellent form and that it's documented in a way that future generations can bear witness that we are here. Wonderful, lovely. Um, I'm, I'm thinking just about, you know, in Islamic tradition, we say God loves beauty, you know, and that you're talking about evidence that's beautiful and documentation that's beautiful and sound that's beautiful. And Rami, you did the same, you know, with just multimedia and, and like the expansive um, invitation and that it's not a tour that 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 moves through but it's a tour that is able to sit in space with people um, and and for you all to be able to bring like the fullness of what you do and what you said Rami of the the you all are so acquainted with that every day um, the everyday grind of doing this work and I'm imagining that people around the country who also have that feeling would be excited to be able to enter into a love space with people who know what that's like, you know, and to nurture each other and to have this beautiful experience and also this beautiful evidence, um, lest we be erased, you know? Uh, so I want to um, go to some questions. Uh, I think we probably just have time for, um, for one question, so. Let's see, I will start, I'm gonna read them both and then maybe you each can choose which one that you, which one you respond to because I can't pick. Um, so first question, um, tell us about place in the album. Rami, you wrote most of these in Chicago. Um, you and Drea recorded in Buffalo and Louisville, but also it harkens back to Jerusalem. What was the connection between the music and space? For Rami, you spoke on the Iman artist roster. Dre also mentioned it. What is the role of the roster, the artist roster in creating this album? And then this album seems to be a call to action. And action is clearly something that Drea and Rami know all about. And as Zabra reminded us, love is action as well. Um, they were reminded us by way of Rumi. So, and then <laughs> tell us a little about the work that has fueled the, the album. Both of you were neck deep in doing organizing and advocacy for some very important causes. So those are like deep and rich and beautiful questions. I'm going to invite you, y'all see why I couldn't pick. So <laughs> I'm gonna invite you all to just choose one um, to respond to. I can, I can respond to space and, and you know, Iman has this, you know, driven idea about art as, you know, spatially relevant, uh, spiritually, socially conscious and spiritually rooted. And I, I think space was really, uh, really important. Not only did I, I, I was writing on the South Side for most of um, this time, but 
uh, a lot of the performance, you know, uh, Drea's Buffalo became a really important space for me, even personally. I think after Drea talked about extending invitation into space, uh, Drea was extraordinarily intentional with me and about making sure I really had an opportunity to feel the space that I was in. And I, I, I was flying to Buffalo very often throughout this last year. It was, it's only like an hour flight and hour and some change. And um, I would, you know, be in between the studio, but oftentimes it would be Dre and I meeting Dre's grandmother, Dre taking me to, you know, her, her mother's taking me to uh, activists, organizers, artists, artists would come into the studio, activists would be in the studio, uh, just the art, just everyone, the very strong community that is very resonant with me here in Chicago. Uh, but I had an opportunity to experience and feel and be completely absorbed in uh, outside of Chicago. That opportunity to have that space um, was, was really a critical part of this um, writing process, the creation process, the collaboration process. And um, it, it really, again, became for me um, a, uh, a sanctuary uh, in the middle of very difficult and trying times. Um, and so, I think uh, that is something also that I think is important when we talk about love is having spaces where you feel nurtured, you can, you can run to for, uh, if you will, uh, rejuvenation and, um, and, and Buffalo really became that space for me this last year. I'm just like imagining what processes would look like if it was like, yeah, but before we go to the studio, let's go have lunch with my grandmother, right? <laughs> Before we go to the studio, I've got some organizers that you need to meet. I mean, but it goes back to just what Dre was talking about with organic collaboration, you know, and just that that's how you both move, you know, um, and that that really becomes the thing that um, fortifies, right, what makes the, the invitations and, and the calls so beautiful on the album. Sister Dre, if you want to add? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't um, plan on... Uh, making so many invitations or introductions. Um, but honestly, when, when Rami came, every time Rami came, it's like, I, I wanted my people to be there uh, because that's how I work. Like when I'm in the studio, um, like my friends like, well, I wanna come, you know? And sometimes I can't have anybody in the studio because it's just so sacred and um, it's almost like having a baby, you know, like you don't have everybody in the delivery room because it's a sacred moment and you need to focus and you need to support and you need to breathe. And um, so if, if, if anybody is going to be there, they need to understand like what's happening and like be present with you, you know? So it's important to me, like when I'm in the studio, it always feels like I'm in, I'm in, in a space I'm delivery. I, I'm all, I always feel like I'm about to give birth to a new life and, and I can't push alone. So I, I lean on the people that I love. Um, sometimes I just need to hug them like Mom McGee, she's an elder in my community. I call her my queen mother. I just need to hug her before I go to the studio because I know I'm gonna be locked in there for 10 hours. So I'm like, come on, Robin, we gotta go, we gotta go do this. And in the process, I, I need you to know this woman because you don't know me if you don't know Mama McGee. You don't know me if you don't know my grandmother. You don't know me at all. You can't understand why I offer the way that I do if you don't know um, the people who loved me first. And um, and I have the blessing of, of loving. Um, I wanted to mention that um, in Buffalo, also um, there, this summer while we were recording, we were fighting to get Cario's law passed. Uh, we were fighting to uh, get Cario's and are still fighting for Cario Horn to get her pension. And Cario Horn is the officer who intervened back in, um, you know, like 14 years ago, uh, before it was a trend, before it was popular. She, she intervened when a, she was a police officer and another officer um, was choking a man probably to death if she didn't intervene. And as a result of that, she lost everything, her job, um, she lost the community, she lost her pension, she lost peace of mind. Her children have suffered greatly um, because of this. So she, in the process of her, of her suffering, she's still thinking about other people in the community. So she created this law 
that would mandate that officers intervene. And when they do, they would be protected. Um, there's restorative justice for whistleblowers. If they don't intervene, then it, it would be named a crime and therefore punishable. And there will be consequences for that. And um, just there's some other points to carry those law, but I think it's necessary, something that's not only Buffalo needs, but I think every city and every state in um, America needs a Cario's law. So it was a beautiful opportunity uh, for us, Rami and I, to uplift Cario's law and um, to to put out a national call to Cario's law and to link that and and uplift that um, on the platform that is Mama's Mama's Please and um, Alhamdulillah, like the law was passed in Buffalo, New York, you know, and I do think that this work, this album, that that song played a very important role in the passing of that law in the city, but there's so much more work to be done. So in, in having a, a worldwide tour, you know, we will always have the opportunity to talk about why we need to carry this law. We will always have the opportunity to, to fight to see that um, carry a horn is not just another hashtag um, a post-humans um, hashtag that we honor and we cry for and we make t-shirts about, but we have a beautiful opportunity to lift up this woman who is also a mother of five children and honor her and continue to fight for her own justice and to support her in, in justice seeking for the greater community at large. Beautiful, beautiful. Mm -hmm. And brilliant. Um, I want to, I mean, Benta has been so great in dropping websites in the chat, and I just want to invite people to do a deep dive into those chats to learn about Cario's Law and, you know, the other things that we're mentioning. I think um, certainly the link to the album and things like that, that Sadia will share more about. But um, I just want to share my gratitude um, to Drea and Rami just for being who you are and doing what you did and inviting us and giving us the invitation with this work. Um, Drea, I think you're brilliant. Rami, I think you're brilliant. I'm inspired by both of you and um, and just grateful to be able to um, to support you know this project in conversations like these. And then my last thing, folks, is just to say, we've only talked about three songs. <laughs> like you can imagine, you know, kind of the wealth of, of, of feeling and meditation and reflection that can go from, you know, talking about all these songs. So just thank you all for your generosity um, in sharing your process and for continuing to invite us even as you, um, as you answer the questions. So thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, and thank you Zeba for your words. Uh, thank you, Dr. Crystal. Um, how do you guide us through such a rich conversation in such a, I mean, we just like flow through water, didn't even realize what we we're getting into. So thank you so much for uh, your art and guiding us through the conversation. Thank you, Drea and Rami for your, for the album, for the work. And um, on top of that, all the work that y'all do in community space uh, in your respective places. Um, I think for me, just in my closing remarks, and I know we're over time here, but just, just to close, really this love thing speaks is 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 a quintessential you know collaboration and uh, body of art that represents what uh, the work that Iman seeks to do on the day in and the day out um, as a space that not only fosters you know health wellness and healing um, in the inner city in Chicago and Atlanta but also a space that truly just seeks to bring the hearts together to unite disconnected people to facilitate a transformative healing and to radically reimagine the world as it could be not only here on the block but also across the world um, in Jerusalem and everywhere in uh, the universal um, you know resonance that this album clearly displays so um, uh, you were excited as Iman to present this touring production uh, God willing the end of next year but that may change because we don't really know what next year will look like. So 2021, 2022 or so. Um, and I wanna ask you all to support this journey. And as, as Drea mentioned earlier, and as Krista was saying, this is not just a touring production that comes and goes, but as an offering and an invitation to holding space as community, as we go through the cities and have workshops and hold community space and build lifelong connections, God willing, and generational connections as well. Um, so my, my ask to you to support this is to stay connected to this Love Thing project and to share 
um, to watch the video, Mama, please, to share that, um, to share that video. Um, several of you on this call are, are connected to major media outlets, to major influencers or um, celebrities, even if you will, and organizations, entities, foundations. Several, several of you all represent those yourselves. So um, we're also looking for partners uh, for this touring production next year. Um, uh, again, that can be with the resources to make it happen, the connections to the venues or to, um, you know, just supporting the artists that it will require to put this on, but also even as we're exploring a, um, an expert kind of uh, committee that will steer this, this touring production. So we will be reaching out to several of you um, and we look forward to hearing from y'all proactively as well, um, you know, if you're interested. Um, and so, so please, please look out for that. Um, and I think Vinta just will drop the, the social the social media handles and the hashtag. Again, that's a hashtag this love thing and hashtag Iman Arts um, and the link to, the, to, the, to, to listen to the album and to watch the video as well as uh, uh, Progress Theater's uh, website. Definitely wanna uh, check out Crystal's, uh, Dr. Crystal's production company, Progress Theater. And I, I believe that's all. Um, I believe that's all for here. So again, as we opened up in a state of gratitude, I want to close in that state of gratitude to the Most High for this rich conversation, for all the people that stopped your day and made time to be here, um, and for the technology, albeit there were some difficulties, but just to be able to hold this space. Thank you all so much, and we look forward to being in touch with you. Peace. <laughs>